Hi, I'm Vass, and I'm here today to talk about MAME. MAME emulates arcade video games spanning multiple decades and technology generations. But MAME isn't just about traditional video games. MAME emulates electromechanical redemption games, electronic toys, handheld LCD games, gambling systems like slots and video poker, computers, and much more. But MAME is more than an emulator. MAME acts as a form of living documentation. MAME drivers specify the major devices that make up a system and the connections between them. MAME strives to emulate hardware well enough for original software to run without patches or hacks. Our interactive debugger is something we take particular pride in. It's included in every supported configuration and can target every CPU MAME emulates. With it, you can see not only what the software does, but how it works. MAME's goal is preservation of our digital heritage, and this is important because software is culture. Now, the most obvious acknowledgement of this is that software is almost universally eligible for copyright protection. Only creative works receive copyright protection. Over the past half a century, software has provided shared experiences. Have you ever reminisced about using Amiga OS? Did you challenge someone to a game of Tech Can Tag in an arcade? Did you learn to use a software package for your first desk job? Video games specifically are an entertainment and storytelling medium. Space Invaders, Doom and Fortnite are all examples of video games that became cultural phenomena. We're sometimes asked why MAME emulates terrible games. We believe that all culture is worthy of preservation. Something that seems inconsequential now may be considered notable in the future. Do you think the average Roman thought the graffiti on the walls in Pompeii was important? As an example, video games reflect the hopes and fears of a generation. Missile Command evokes fear of nuclear annihilation, while Strikers 1945 is a fantasy of humanity uniting against a common foe. Namen Nayo parodies Japanese gang culture, while NARC is born out of the US war on drugs. NBA Jam and NFL Blitz let teenagers step into the shoes of their sporting heroes. It's often the mundane photos that provide the best windows into the way of life of prior generations, and the same can be said for software. CPM, WordStar and VisiCalc give a hands-on experience of the computer revolution in the office. You can see how much has changed as well as how much hasn't. If you want to share memories with the, your children, you might find a second-hand copy of a book you enjoyed, or maybe a reprint or scan. You might buy a Blu-ray edition of a classic film. I guess I'm showing my age there. Do you just stream everything these days? MAME allows you to experience software from the past and share that with the next generation. On a personal note here, a couple of years ago, I wanted to show my son Street Fighter EX2+, but it really wasn't the same without spatial audio effects. This pushed me to emulate the AT&T DSP-16 CPU in MAME. It's important that we actually make an effort to preserve software, because software is very fragile. It might be easy to losslessly duplicate bits, but computers, operating systems and software platforms can become obsolete surprisingly quickly. Some forms of protection and DRM can even make duplicating the bits difficult. Today I'm going to talk specifically about dragging MAME into the 21st century and some of the practicalities of a large open source project with two decades of history. This is not going to be a highly technical talk. I'm going to focus more on the non-technical side of MAME development. Let's touch on a few milestones in MAME's history. We'll see why these are particularly significant a bit later. In February 1997, Nicola Salmoria's Multipack expanded in scope to become the Multiple Arcade Machine Emulator, abbreviated as MAME. While Multipack had targeted arcade games utilising similar hardware to Pac-Man, MAME was open to all arcade video games. In June 1998, less than two years later, the first version of MESS was released. MESS, or the Multi-Emulator Super System, was a fork of MAME targeting video game consoles and home computers. MESS was by no means the only MAME fork with different emulation targets. Arcade Gambling Extensions for MAME, abbreviated as Age MAME, was a fork targeting gambling systems, and Misfit MAME was a fork that emulated arcade video games considered ineligible for inclusion in MAME at the time. 
Skipping forward, in October 2014, MAME's master source code repository was hosted on GitHub. And in May 2015, after almost three years of sharing a source code repository, MESS was fully integrated into MAME. At this point, MAME ceased to mean anything as an acronym. In March 2016, our arduous relicensing process was completed and MAME 0.172 was released under the terms of the GNU General Public License version 2. MAME has always been dogged by rumours of its demise. We've been told that we waste all our time emulating systems no one cares about. Now, exactly which systems we're wasting time on seems to be in constant flux. At one point, it was Japanese Mahjong games. I think for a while, it was 3D games that would never run at playable speeds. Korean games got a bad rap for a while, as did certain handheld LCD games. More recently, it's been Unix workstations and TV games. Another perennial complaint is that MAME always gets slower. This is true to some extent. More accurate emulation often comes at a cost in terms of system requirements. One complaint that's become more frequently recently is that MAME developers are a bunch of grumpy old men. I'm not quite sure how to take this. I've got a lot of grey hair on my chest. Am I grumpy enough not to disappoint? But despite this, MAME stubbornly refuses to die. Here's the very unscientific measure of commits to master per month over the past decade or so. There's what looks like some seasonal variation and a few peaks, but overall the rate picked up in late 2012 and has been pretty stable ever since. The graph ends on a bit of a lull as people put their, took their end of year holidays. Here's the equally unscientific measure of unique Git authors over time. You can see that this really started to increase in late 2014 when we moved to GitHub and has been growing ever since. MAME is still attracting contributors. This ability to attract contributors is really what's kept the project alive. MAME lives on active development. Development drives user interest and inactive projects tend to wither. In a way, MAME development is MAME's primary use case. MAME development is challenging. MAME is a fairly mature project. Basic functionality is complete. MAME enjoyed exciting daily progress in the early days because there was lots of easy stuff to do. We'll never see that again because the obvious easy stuff has all been done. Most of the time, the remaining stuff is difficult for one reason or another. MAME has been developed over a period of decades, so it comes with a lot of baggage. Some of that comes from decisions that made sense at the time, but are now weighing us down due to different demands and changes in the technological landscape. Some of it comes from things that were built without really being designed. When a project gets as big as MAME, major refactoring and core changes become increasingly difficult. There are a lot of use cases to consider, and things need to be designed carefully to avoid painting ourselves into a corner. Migrating everything at once may not be an option, and we need to keep everything working as much as possible. Contributing to MAME comes with a number of constraints. System drivers need to work within MAME's architecture. This includes things like using the core scheduler, modular devices, and MAME's configurable slot system. MAME's core components are still under active development, and contributors need to keep up. We do take care of updating anything that's already in the master repository, but MAME is not a static target. Developing a system, single system emulator gives you a lot more freedom. You know all the components and how they fit together. You can build the user interface around how the system is used. MAME's broad scope means a lot of things have to be very generic. There's also MAME's guiding principles or philosophy. We don't just aim to make games run. We do our best to let software run how it did on the original hardware. That means we don't do things like patching out system calls or injecting drivers for virtual hardware. We explicitly avoid features for subjective enhancement. But contributing to MAME is attractive in many ways. Some of these are applicable to emulators in general. There are always interesting challenges and things to discover. There's the satisfaction as things fall into place and the excitement of seeing a system run for the first time. MAME, and emulators in general, often appeal to people's sense of nostalgia, and MAME is not your day job. You can work on what you find interesting at your own pace. More specifically, 
MAME has an extensive library of emulated devices. Systems built from off-the-shelf components can be emulated with relatively little code. You can worry about the system-specific stuff. There's a lot of stuff to already taken care of. Historically, MAME was quite exclusive. MAME emulated arcade video games. Gambling systems were excluded specifically. For a while, low-effort bootleg arcade games were excluded too. There were reasons for this. Limiting the scope was supposed to keep the project focused. People worried that accepting low-effort bootlegs would encourage people to minimally modify arcade games in the hope of seeing their creations added to MAME. This led to proliferation of forks, like MES for game consoles and computers, and H MAME for gambling systems. People liked the framework MAME provided and wanted to use it for things outside MAME's narrow scope. One of the most obvious detrimental effects of this was duplicated effort. A device would be emulated for a system in MESS, then when an arcade game using the same device was found and dumped, MAME would end up with a separate implementation. MAME's implementation would, be would turn out to be inadequate for how the device was used in MESS. With developers spread out across the forks, silos formed. Major issues weren't tackled with the needs of all the related projects in view, and there was a general lack of communication. Since absorbing the forks, MAME has realised some great benefits. With everything under one roof, we've got more test cases for our device library. For example, the same microcontrollers used for copy protection on arcade games were often used as keyboard controllers in home computers. The different use cases often stress different aspects of the emulation. Any improvements to the core or device library are available to everyone immediately. You no longer have to wait for a merge from upstream or worry that it's going to be incompatible with a local change in a fork. We've now got all the developers under one roof, so to speak. There are still developers who gra gravitate towards particular areas, whether that's home computers, arcade games or workstations. But there's a lot more communication, and if you decide you want to dabble with something different, there are no artificial barriers. For someone looking to try emulating a less mainstream system, there's no need to choose a fork anymore. MAME is the natural choice. But when someone's looking to get started, we don't want them to get scared off early. It's important to make the project approachable. We like to have things everyone can do. Not everyone is a software developer. People can contribute to MAME by sourcing and dumping media, whether that's arcade game ROMs, floppy disks, or even punch tapes for early home computers. Tracking this stuff down and getting good dumps is a challenge in its own right. People can report emulation issues and provide test cases. Making layouts for systems that aren't primarily video-based doesn't require any programming. There's the user documentation as well. These avenues of contributing can make people feel more directly involved in the project, even if they aren't programmers. Having regular releases benefits everyone. Previews of ongoing development are far more exciting if you know you won't be waiting more than a month or two to try it out if you haul yourself. Tracking down regressions, yes, we do occasionally break things, is simpler when everyone's looking at the same project-wide checkpoints. The release process itself becomes more time-consuming if too much has happened since the previous release. Public access to the project's version control system makes life easier for people who want to contribute source code. It's simpler to follow on with more frequent updates. Seeing individual commits with descriptive messages lets you understand what's changing and why. You won't feel like the rug's been pulled out from under you when a release finally arrives and it looks like everything's changed. It also allows for quicker feedback from the community. People who compile the, from source or play with nightly builds can discuss the effects of changes sooner. This is easier than ever with free hosting from the likes of GitHub, GitLab and SourceForge. Distributed version control systems make it really easy to replicate repositories or migrate them to different hosting if need be. It's also critical to have a, con a transparent submission process. Now, this is something MAME really didn't do well in the past. The way it used to work was you emailed your changes as a source code diff against the most recent release. In all probability, you wouldn't hear anything back directly, so you'd wait for the next release, which didn't come out on any kind of predictable schedule, 
and check the source code to see if your changes had been applied. If they hadn't, you'd try to get a hold of a high-ranking main developer on a forum and ask what was going on. The turnaround time really killed your momentum. The pull request workflow is much better for everyone. If a change is accepted, you see it happen immediately. Feedback is public, so anyone who wants to follow along can see what kind of things are encouraged or discouraged. Once again, this is something that's easier to do than it was in the past, with the features provided by platforms like GitHub. Let's take a moment to talk about idiomatic code. Here's a sample of what main source code used to look like around the end of 2014. This function instantiates some audio devices and makes connections between them. Did I mention it's a function? You might not have guessed, given how everything's hidden behind macros. The macros have multiple prefixes as a kind of crude namespacing, and it looks like the code is yelling at you. The macros didn't just obfuscate the code for humans, they didn't work well with IDE features like syntax highlighting and code completion either. That's the kind of code you had to write to instantiate devices. Here's some of what you would have had to do if you wanted to write a device class yourself. Every device needed a whole lot of preprocessor macros for instantiation and configuration. The first macro here for adding a YM2151 sound chip expands to another lower level macro. The macros for connecting callbacks use hidden local device and devcb variables created by the machine config fragment macro. On top of that, they're using token pasting to add this devcb prefix to the argument to make the client code less verbose. If we look at the member functions that actually connect the callbacks, they're relying on downcasts. If you called them when the hidden local variables weren't in the right state, you wouldn't get a compiler error. It might crash horribly when the code was run, or it could cor corrupt memory and fail in even less obvious ways later. You'd almost think this was designed for an underhanded C competition. Writing devices was a black art that no one fully understood People relied on copy-pasting and cargo culting. If you look at the same drivers today, it's barely recognisable. The function is a class member with a simple signature that isn't hidden behind multiple macros. There are no magic local variables for macros to use. The NCFG macros have given way to member function calls. It's a lot easier for humans to read. Everything's typed properly, so IDEs can provide suggestions, and you'll get a compile error if you try to use a configuration function that isn't applicable. Refactoring is safer because things fail sooner in the development workflow. It's easier for the people writing the devices too. There are no more macros to write, and the configuration member functions are far simpler. Here are the YM2151 callback configuration functions as they appear today, there isn't really much to say about them anymore. Writing a reusable device is far simpler when things aren't obfuscated, so more people do it. At one point, MAME's macro meta language for machine configuration was actually one of its strong points. So how did it end up becoming a liability? Well, C++ compilers evolved and C++ itself evolved. Without C++14, we'd still be writing macro soup. Despite accusations of bloat, new C++ features are actually there to solve real-world problems and can make the language more expressive. Code is easier to read as well as write if you aren't working around limitations of the language. Use features when they make code safer and more readable or improve performance, but don't fall into the trap of using features just for the sake of it. Part of understanding a feature is knowing when it's inappropriate to use. Now, writing the framework code that underpins these sweeping changes was difficult. It requires an understanding of what the language can and can't do, and you can find yourself fighting compiler bugs if you start to use newer or more obscure language features. You need to consider existing use cases as well as what the current limitations are. You don't want to update everything only to find you need to replace it all again sooner rather than later. Main is big and updating everything to use the new syntax took months. While this was happening, things were arguably worse than they were to begin with. It would have been too much effort to update everything at once, and leaving everything broken wasn't an option. 
This meant using various tricks to support new and old syntax at the same time and temporarily dealing with clashing styles throughout the code base. Ensuring in legacy code isn't added is a challenge. After working on the project for years, you become accustomed to the framework and any major change is an upheaval. Developers like to learn by example, and it's hard to do things the new way when most of the available examples haven't been updated. Leaving things as they were would have been the path of least resistance, but we're definitely better off for making the changes. We've got higher productivity. It's easier to write reusable device classes now, so more people do it. The code is safer and clearer, and more errors are caught at compile time. We spend far less time tracking down runtime errors like bad cast exceptions, devices not being found, and callback late bind errors caused by silly mistakes in machine configuration code. If you understand C++, the new syntax is fairly intuitive. If you can understand the code more easily, you can more easily edit it or use it as an example to write new code of your own. When someone gets curious and looks at the source code, this can be the factor that decides whether they want to get more involved or walk away because it looks too difficult. Open source projects do need management at some level. For the most part, management in MAME only happens at a very high level and at a very low level, with nothing in between. At the high level, we can set overall goals and direction for the project. At the low level, we do have some best practices for how MAME's framework should be used and there are a few coding standards we can more or less agree on. However, there's no task assignment or prioritization. Most contributors work on what they find interesting at their own pace. There are exceptions. If a change causes serious regressions, it usually needs to be fixed or backed out. There's some coordination when it comes to core functionality changes that affect everyone. There's a common misunderstanding about this. We're often asked, why don't you guys just spend a month working on X? Putting aside coordination issues, the answer is that for that to happen, you need a month where, you, where everyone decided they wanted to work on the same thing, and that's just not going to happen. There are going to be times when decisions need to be made. No decision is going to make everyone happy, but indecision is going to make everyone unhappy. Decisions need to be well-reasoned, and the goal always needs to be the good of the project as a whole. Solicit input if you need to. Explain major decisions and lay out the thought process behind them. Don't assume that it's as obvious to everyone as it is to you. Also, the process makes you more likely to realize when a decision isn't so crash hot. If you feel stupid explaining your decision, there's a fair chance your decision is stupid. Set a minimum bar for quality in your project. Bad code weighs everyone down, and it's a lot easier to do something right the first time than it is to fix it after the fact. Explain what's wrong with submissions that don't meet standards. Be specific in your criticisms. I really hate it when someone says, this code smells. It's effectively, I don't like this code, but I can't articulate why. That doesn't help anyone. Specific criticism is good, and explaining or providing an example of the preferred implementation is even better. That helps people feel they've learnt something. Document standards if it's practical. It's hard to avoid breaking rules that you don't know exist. This is an area where main is lacking, and I'll admit right now that I'm not good at expressing this kind of stuff at the right level. I find it difficult to articulate coding standards without becoming overly prescriptive. Always remember that as a leader or manager, your job is to make sure everyone can do their jobs. Often that means knowing when it's time to get out of the way. One thing every project needs to do is choose a license. Unless you have very specific requirements, I'd urge you to choose a license that's approved by the Open Source Initiative, the Free Software Foundation, or ideally by both of them. These licenses are written and audited by real intellectual property lawyers, so they're unambiguous and likely to hold up in court if necessary. They're widely understood, so someone wanting to contribute or make use of your code won't need to spend time and potentially money auditing the license. Using an OSI or FSF approved license comes with perks too. Many companies make tools or services available at no cost for open source or free software development. This is most often defined as being distributed under the terms of an OSI or FSF approved license. 
Running your own license is fraught with danger. MAME previously had a custom copyleft license. It had a disclaimer, it required complete source to be distributed, and it prohibited commercial use. The actual wording was, redistributions may not be sold, nor may they be used in a commercial product or activity. Now, if you're at all familiar with the OSI or the FSF, you'll know that this doesn't meet their definitions of open source or free software. This was a way to voice disapproval towards people using MAME to build things like bootleg arcade multi-game kits. Of course, in practice, it didn't really have much effect. Arcade bootleggers are already ignoring copyright on the games themselves. They're not going to care about complying with a copyleft license on an emulator when the source code's right there in front of them. As well as missing out on the previously mentioned perks, writing your own license can severely limit adoption of your code. Adding any restrictions to your license will make it incompatible with popular copyleft licenses that explicitly prohibit this, like the GNU GPL and the CDDL. Restrictions can also have unintended side effects. Museums that charge for entry felt they couldn't use MAME in interactive exhibits without uh, 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 violating the license because selling tickets is a commercial activity. Rights holders looking to reissue games couldn't leverage MAME in their products either. Bad guys ignore licenses anyway, so the restrictions in the MAME license were only hurting the good guys, the people trying to do the right thing by everyone. This was clearly an undesirable situation. To remedy this, we undertook an effort to allow MAME as a whole to be distributed under the terms of the GNU General Public License version 2. This was a time-consuming process. We had to identify contributors, find means of contacting them, and explain what we were doing and why. In some cases, we had to remove code that we couldn't obtain permission to relicense and re-implement the functionality later. This is all time that could have been better spent productively. You don't want to have to go through this, so think carefully when choosing a license. Now, we could have avoided the trouble if we had a contributor license agreement that required copyright assignment. However, that comes with its own set of issues. It can make a project less attractive to contributors because they may feel they'll lose control over their code. You also need to choose a trustworthy copyright custodian and have a handover plan for contingencies. This may require incorporating a company to serve as the legal entity holding copyright. Let's talk a little about promoting your product. Admittedly, this is something Maine could do a lot better. There's a lot you can do to keep people interested. Make sure people want to read your release notes. Write an executive summary calling out the highlights. Give some kind of summary of changes that non-developers can understand. Each main release comes with lists of resolved issues, newly supported systems and software, and merged pull requests. If you're working on something interesting, people will love to read progress reports. Some of the things people particularly like are videos of newly supported systems running, before after comparisons highlighting bug fixes, and anecdotes about the development process. Try demonstrating some of the cool things that can be achieved with new features when you implement them. Now I know as well as anyone how hard this can be. You've just finished something off and pushed your changes. Do you really want to go to the effort of making a publicity video or blog post? It's more likely you just want to take a break or jump straight into the next task. It can really help if you've got a natural publicist on the team, someone who can take a crude description of a change from a developer and turn it into a press release. Yes, this is another way people who aren't software developers can contribute to open source software. It really pays to have a social media presence. Get out there on the forums that your users frequent, answer the genuine questions. Give your answers context. People are often curious about the reason things are the way they are. If you find the same questions coming up repeatedly, it could mean something is lacking in your documentation. If you do this, it will help spread knowledge through the community. Soon enough, you'll find that the community can answer a lot of the simpler or more common questions before you even see them. You can gain a lot of goodwill by implementing low effort feature requests. If someone requests a feature nicely, 
and it's easy to implement and it won't break anything, you've got absolutely nothing to lose by doing it. But you stand to gain one very thrilled and user and potential future project evangelist. Before we get to the q and I'm going to end with some random advice from, from my experience with MAME. Stay true to your goals. MAME has stubbornly stuck to its core principles of preservation and raising the bar for emulation. We haven't bowed to public pressure to compromise, whether that's by taking shortcuts, excluding supposedly unworthy emulation targets, or implementing whatever hacks are currently in vogue. MAME has thrived by doing this. After decades, MAME is still actively developed and taking on emulation targets that were considered impossible not that long ago. Just a few short years ago, the Nintendo Game & Watch line were considered impossible to emulate accurately. MAME has grown to be bigger than any one person, and this is a bridge a project has to cross if it's to be viable long term. MAME has transitioned through half a dozen coordinators with very different management styles and their emphasis on different areas. Release notes still felt feature a few familiar names, but there are lots of new faces. I'm going to do my best to ensure MAME has what it takes to outlive me. You can't finish something you don't start. Don't focus on the obstacles between you and the goal. Focus on the steps you can take to get there. Looking back over the past few years, we've pulled off some amazing internal changes to MAME while keeping the vast majority of stuff working. None of this would have been done if we'd only looked at how far away the goal was. If it stops being fun, take a step back. As I mentioned before, one of the purported attractions of MAME is that it isn't your day job. There's no point working on it if you don't enjoy it. There's always plenty to do, so you can switch tasks if you hit a wall or want to try something different. You can walk away, and when you come back, MAME will still be there for you. And finally, don't lose sight of MAME's purpose. MAME is here to ensure that software isn't lost to time. Make the most of that. Play a game console that you wanted but never bought. Try out a computer from the opposite side of the Iron Curtain. Maybe write a program in a language you were too, long to ha too young to have the dubious pleasure of working with. I'm going to leave it there. I haven't used up all my allotted time, so we have plenty of time for questions and answers. If there are no questions, I guess we can all head out and get a beer early. Thanks for watching.